the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence,
4 to 8, chapter 1, and then chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Hello everyone, today is Pentecost. As we celebrate Pentecost, Aline and I will talk about the Holy Spirit. You might have also heard other names for it, like the Holy Ghost, or the Comforter, or the Spirit of God. With all these names, we are talking about the same Spirit, the personal presence of God. Not just a force of God, but a person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not God the Father, it's also not Jesus. God like them. On Pentecost, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus walked on earth, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us here on earth. But I will begin by speaking about the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost. The first time we read about the Holy Spirit in the Bible is in Genesis 1-2, the first page of the Bible. We read that the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The Spirit of God brings light and life. Even before creation began, we read that the Spirit was hovering over the dark and disorder, ready to begin spreading goodness and creation. The Spirit is God's power to bring life, it is the breath of life that entered Adam's nostrils to make him a living being. Throughout the whole Old Testament, we read how the Holy Spirit influences and empowers human beings by enabling their human abilities with divine enhancements in order to also bring light and goodness. Joseph was elevated by Pharaoh to a position of authority because he was the one in whom the Spirit of God was. Joseph was enabled by the Spirit of God so that no one was more discerning or wiser at his time. When God ordered for his tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant to be built, he chose a man, Bezalel, and filled him with the Spirit of God to have extraordinary knowledge and skills to make artistic designs and crafts for him. The prophets were also filled with the Spirit to bring the message of God to the people of Israel. They were empowered to discern and see that God's perfect world was being corrupted by human evil. In a way, mankind had turned the earth to the dark and disordered state that it was in when the Spirit of God first hovered over it. But there was hope that the Spirit of God would once again bring light and life to earth. The prophet Ezekiel envisioned how, through the Holy Spirit, Israel, that was rebellious, would be transformed into a new creation. We read in Ezekiel what God said to Israel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This promise would be fulfilled by the Messiah. The Messiah would reconcile man with God. 
And the prophet Isaiah spoke how the Messiah would come to rule and be empowered to do all this by the Holy Spirit. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his root, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Fast forward to the New Testament. God's Messiah was on earth, Jesus. Jesus had grown and was a man ready to begin his ministry. The prophecy from Isaiah was fulfilled when Jesus went to John the Baptist. And when Jesus was baptized, and as he was praying, heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit in a form of a dove descended on him. And a voice from heaven said, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus is God and divine, but he's also human, with human consciousness, human feelings, and a human body. It's a difficult concept to grasp many times that Jesus was both fully 100% God and still fully 100% man. But because of this, because of his humanity, he needed the Holy Spirit to communicate with God the Father and do all the works for him. And we read in the Gospel that Jesus was often empowered by the Spirit in his mission, for instance, in Luke 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Or in Luke 10, at this time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. The Holy Spirit gives power and wisdom to Jesus to see and understand the Father's plan. Jesus prayed in the Spirit to bring his worries and praises to the Father. With the Spirit, Jesus healed the sick and cast out demons. Jesus is God and divine, but in reference to God the Father, he let go of his right of divinity. In humbleness, he was born as a man. In faith, Jesus trusted the Father and was filled with God's Spirit to do his work. Later, Alini will talk about how we can be just like Jesus, how we can humble ourselves to God, know what we too, and know that we too need God's Spirit to carry out His work, and we too can be filled with the Spirit. And the last thing that I want to talk about is similar to what I spoke out in the beginning. The Spirit of God is life bringing. In the midst of darkness, evil, and sadness, the Holy Spirit can bring restoration. The epicenter of history that shows this characteristic of the Holy Spirit was in Jesus' resurrection. As Paul later wrote in Romans, it was the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. This shows that there is nothing that the Holy Spirit cannot bring life into, whether it is to a dark and formless earth or even to death itself. So Paul continues his letter as he writes, The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. If the same Holy Spirit lives in you, he will give life to your bodies in the same way. So then, Christian brothers, we are not to do what our sinful old selves want us to do. If you do what your sinful old selves want you to do, you will die in sin. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you destroy those actions to which the body can be led you will have life. And now Alini will talk about the day of Pentecost. Right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he reminded the disciples that the Holy Spirit would come and give them power to witness in Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. He also instructed them to not leave Jerusalem until this happens. Now, why did Jesus explicitly tell them not to leave Jerusalem? Try to imagine the context the disciples were in. Jesus had just been killed right in the city that he asked them to wait. We read in John 20, 19, that right after the crucifixion, the disciples would lock themselves in a room in fear of the Jewish leaders. So every day that passed increased their chances of being, being caught. 
When Jesus told them to wait, he said that they would need to wait for a few days. Sometimes when Bruno tells me to wait for a few days, I wonder if that thing will ever happen. I can imagine that for the disciples, waiting a few days would also be a challenge. Wondering if the spirits that they didn't fully understand would ever come as well. Unfortunately, we human beings are naturally impatient and the waiting period for a promise to be fulfilled seems like an eternity. Only with the power of the Holy Spirit we can learn to wait for God's timing. But even with their impatient hearts and their fear of the Jewish leaders, the disciples obeyed Jesus by waiting and praying. In verse 14 from Acts 1, we see that they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. It does not say that they prayed few times a day. It says that they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. So that helped also to wait for the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is the true waiting for the Holy Spirit, prayer. The ministry of Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit descending on him at his baptism, showing the unity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was a milestone from the beginning of his ministry. In the same way, the ministry of the disciples depended on them receiving the Holy Spirit and relying on his power to begin their ministry of proclaiming Jesus to the world. The disciples had experienced a measure of this spirit before. In John 20, 22, um, Jesus breathed the spirit on them. But now, the Spirit would come to live in them permanently and be with them all the time. The time finally came when the disciples were celebrating the Jewish Harvest Festival that was called Shabbat, and the Holy Spirit came on them. In Acts, it says that it sounded like a very strong wind and it looked like tongues of fire. Now, the fire, ever since the Old Testament, represents the presence of God in a place. There is the example in Exodus 3 of the burning bush when God calls Moses to free his people from Egypt. Or from Exodus 13 when God guided his people with a pillar of fire in the desert. So the fire coming on Pentecost over the disciples' head also represented God coming to live inside of his new temple, the believers. So the Pentecost was a very special historical event that marks a new period of God's relationship with his people. It is God equipping his church with the power of his spirit so that he will be glorified among the nations. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, the disciples found themselves speaking in foreign, foreign language, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The festival that they were celebrating was a big deal. The city was filled with Jews from many places. This was the perfect opportunity for the disciples to preach the word for people all around the world. So they, went, they went to the streets and they started to tell everyone about Jesus. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak in different languages. So those who were in the city, for the festival could understand in their own language the disciples declaring the wonders of God. Some people thought that they were drunk, but then Peter spoke up to the crowd, proclaiming the gospel, and on that day, 3,000 believed in Jesus. Here you can see a big difference between the disciples before the Holy Spirit came and after. Before they were afraid, they were locking themselves in the room, um, hiding from the leaders. Or you can even see like Peter denying Jesus out of fear. They were shy. They were weak. They were uncertain of what was going to happen. But then after the Holy Spirit came, they became brave and bold. They even went to the street shouting the wonders of God. They became strong and they were not uncertain anymore. The point of Pentecost's mission and the goal of the mission 
is written in Habakkuk number 214 that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. By accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit lives in you, giving you also the power to witness to people from all around the world. The Holy Spirit empowers us in many ways through the gifts of the Spirit. So here I want to show you a list of what the gifts are and where you can find them. I don't want to go in too deep into that, but um, just to mention some of them. So here are gifts like mercy, teaching, serving, prophesying, healing, words of wisdom, words of encouragement, and many others. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it's written, Now, to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It is very important to remember that the gifts of the Spirit are for the common good, not for building up status or for any other selfish reasons. God gives us spiritual gifts to enable us to work here on earth and to build our ministry, whether on the streets, whether at work, at university, or even your own house. We can receive many gifts, but as part of the body of Christ, we all have our calling and the gifts are given to us according to what God has called us to do. There is no one greater than other. In um, Corinthians uh, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, from 12 to 31, Paul's make an Paul makes an analogy um, of the body, showing that every part of the body is essential for its function. Just as the festival, Maastricht is also full of people from everywhere in the world. And we can, just as the disciple, reach all the nations in one city. We need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to empower us. We've heard a lot about the Holy Spirit today. We've seen how he has been around from the beginning, through the whole Old Testament, during creation and with the prophets. How he was with Jesus the whole time and showed himself in a form of a dove in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. How the Holy Spirit changed the disciples and empowered them to become representatives and witnesses of Jesus on earth. So now, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit nowadays. What is his role in my life and in your life? In Galatians 5, 22-23, we can read about one of the most iconic characteristics of the transformation that the Spirit can bring to our lives. Once we are baptized by the Spirit and He lives in us, we start to bear new fruit. We can stop relying only on our own human abilities, but through the Spirit, begin to look more like Jesus. We read, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. If we let the Spirit work in us, we can gain all this from God. But you might ask, before I was a Christian, I did have joy in my life. How is this any different? Even before I knew Christ, I was always a very calm and patient person. Why do I need the Holy Spirit for peace and patience? The thing is that if we don't rely on God for these things, we are one way or another relying on the world for it. But the world is not constant and evil exists. I always had joy until I lost everything. I always had faithfulness until I was betrayed. I always had gentleness until I was beaten. I always had patience, but it just took too long. And I always had love until I was rejected. However, God is constant and faithful. His spirit brings light and life, even in darkness. He does not cause evil, but he can use evil to bring light. He did not cause the evil of the cross, but he used it to bring salvation to all. So the fruit of the Spirit is God's wonder-working power in our lives. It is the love we can show when our enemies plot against us. It is the peace we can have when everything is uncertain. 
and it's the kindness we can show when the world is indifferent. So pray constantly that you may be filled with the Spirit and may have a life guided by Him that glorifies God. And now, Aline will finish our talk for today by speaking about the roles of the Spirit. According to the Gospel of John 15, 26, the Holy Spirit begins working on us even before we become Christians. He bears witnesses to Jesus. It is He who makes us aware of who the person of Jesus is and what our task in the world is. He opens our eyes to the truth. He shows us our sins and helps us to be transformed into Jesus' likeness. In John 16, from 7 to 11, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people, people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of his world now stands condemned. The reason why it's for our good that Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came is that the Holy Spirit dwells in everyone that accepts Jesus. When Christ was on earth in his human body, he could not be everywhere all the time and with everyone all the time. But now, as followers of, of Jesus, we get to know the Spirit of God, for he dwells in us and is with us all the time. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, our comforter, our helper, our counselor, our advocate, our straightener. He convinces us of our sins and brings us to righteousness. As the Holy Spirit guided Joshua, gave visions to the prophet, was with Jesus the whole time, and powered the disciples, he can and wants to do the same with us. He has already worked in us by showing and convincing us of the truth of salvation in Jesus. And if we, in humbleness and reverence to God, pray and wait for him, we too can learn to hear his voice, be filled by his spirit, and be completely guided and empowered so that God's name will be glorified. Thank you very much. Now we will have a time of prayer on which um, from your house, you will, you will have a talk with God and a moment to wait as well. So.